I was always really fascinated with the orchestra and with the piano, and I used to love to play. I'm just madly in love with sound design and electronic music, but then also orchestras and pianos. And um, I think that the two fit very well together. I think that they, they, they contrast each other, but they also work really beautifully together. So these are my two big loves. My signature sound is inspired by a producer called Timberland. His records just used to stick out above everybody else's. I feel like they wanted to have their own sound and own their own space and compete with their own frequencies. And um, I wanted to have a sound too. I don't really write about anything funny or silly or lighthearted. Everything is quite deep and real and complex. A lot of people would describe it as dark, where I actually think it's just very truthful. <laughs> but a lot of the music that we hear is like hyper real and uh, just poppy and very like on the surface, you know. I love challenges and I thought it would be really challenging and I wasn't sure how I would even do that. Um, but I know some great musicians in Prague, in the Czech Republic, where I'd recorded before for my previous albums. And uh, I spoke to my friend Radek there and told him about my idea. And he invited me to Prague to look at different studios. How is it going to be to sit in a big studio? How big do I want the piece to be? Do I want to have a small warm space or a big hall? You know, so. I kind of went and did a lot of research. Um, I listened to a lot of pieces, a lot of singers. I went to a lot of concerts. I just went into those spaces and tried to identify what it was that I really was interested in. Prague influenced me a lot. And Radek and his orchestra. And Michaela. And then also my music teacher from school. I called him up and asked him if he could help me with the notation, with making the score. I actually never would have started singing if he hadn't forced me to be in the choir. He was the one and only person that actually bothered to listen to my music and saw some kind of um, promise of something good in my piano pieces at school. And he really encouraged me and he, uh, he's somebody that's watched me grow and develop the last like 10 years. And I just felt like he knows me and he knows classical musicians, and he would be the great connecting person between my like ideas, my abstract concepts, and then these classical players that they really need things written down properly. So this is the very first score that we have, which was made by Paul, with his notes still inside. He made this beautiful book. And yeah, these are all the original notes that we had about the dynamics of the piece. And um, this is the score he used for conducting the session. Could not be more beautiful to have a full symphonic orchestra, four movements, 20 minutes to an hour of time. And I also think it's really awesome to take something that's so old, like it's such an old form of music and to reinvent it. You have all the sounds, you know, you have so many instruments, so many colors to work with. Yeah, like that in contrast to sitting on your own with a computer and a synthesizer and a drum machine, 
just like, yes, <laughs> I want to go there. So this is the glockenspiel. He plays completely on his own. Every, everyone else is quiet here. And yeah, the, the glockenspiel probably plays this amount of notes in his whole career. So for him <laughs> to have so many notes in one piece is kind of a special moment. Yeah, I just searched for stories and I, I, I reflected a lot about my life and about miracles. My laptop often just sat in my bed <laughs> and I used Logic and um, East West Symphonic Library. So I had on my computer all the different sounds from the orchestra and I was using MIDI and just clicking it in with a mouse, all the notes and playing around and then kind of stopping and checking, you know, is that play really playable? And I had to go back to all of my old lessons about instruments and make sure that I wasn't just composing something that people couldn't actually really play comfortably on an instrument. And then I started working with Paul. I used to send him the MIDI files and then he would take the MIDI files and put them into his program called Sibelius, which is software for creating scores traditional music scores. So yeah, I was working um, in Logic and he was working in Sibelius and yeah, I was creating the music and he was creating the book. <laughs> uh, so the Symphony Project was the, the biggest production I've done ever. So there was maybe 80 people involved in the whole thing. Yeah, you have the orchestral costs, the studio costs, travel, catering, pre-production, post-production, manufacturing, distribution, PR, <laughs> artwork, photos, filming, editing. Decided to do a Kickstarter campaign called How To Make A Symphony. And I tried to share as many of these discoveries I'd had, you know, pictures of the studios I'd been to, some notes and ideas about the seating plan, lyrics, you know, problems. I sometimes wrote to, wrote my doubts or my hopes and dreams, you know, just, just everything. It was a real live process happening while I, was, while I was doing the campaign. So it's just a massive thing to do. That's really why I wanted to do this Kickstarter because I feel like it will be this really interesting process that my fans can join me with. And yeah, and then it's like the one of the most beautiful things that's ever happened in my life, but everyone supported me. And um, we were overfunded. So that was really incredible and I couldn't believe it. This was something completely different. I still can't really understand what it that it like happened to me and that so many people um, are interested to support artists, you know, outside of the traditional music business and shops and streaming and all the stuff that we know. There's all these individuals that really want to get involved with art projects because suddenly I was in this position where I'd taken people's money I had dots on a piece of paper. I didn't know how it sounded. I didn't know if it was going to be good. And I had to be the producer of a massive project, which I'd never done before. Most of the people were older than me and more experienced, for sure. And suddenly I was sat in the chair and I had to drive the whole thing and make it work and fix problems and improvise and... Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I had a mini heart attack. everything in Berlin then in our studios here 
using Genelec 8050s and Adam A7X speakers. There were sounds of chairs moving or like people's clothes sometimes. So we tried to clean up some of the unwanted sounds that were distracting, but we left everything as real as it was on the day. Um, we didn't really compress anything that much. It was all kept very naturally sounding. Added some reverb and some delay in a few parts. There were some creative post-production effects. But a lot of the special effects that I wanted to have, rather than putting them on at the end as a post-production effect, I'd actually composed them in the music itself. So I wanted to have echo on the harps and rather than having echo as an effect on the harps, they played slightly out of time with each other. Or they play, you know, they weren't playing exactly on the same point. So they already sounded like there was a delay on them, but it was part of the composition itself. So there was not a lot of um, experimenting to do with the mixing. It was more about preserving what we'd recorded. And um, balancing things a little bit. And then I worked very closely, as I always do, with my mastering engineer, Richie. Yeah, I gave him some ridiculous reference tracks. I think Rihanna and Beyonce. And I told him we need to make it sound as present as these records. Because it's nothing worse with classical music, like when you listen in a car and it's like suddenly loud and then it's gone and then it's suddenly loud and then you can't hear it anymore. And with all classical music, I'm constantly turning it up and down, up and down, up and down. And I didn't want to have that with this record. I wanted to put it on. seating plan was something that was very important for me and when I had the chance to do my own uh, we did it more like this so we had the conductor here and I wanted Michaela to be more in the middle usually uh, the soprano would stand to the side if it was a live concert so the audience could see the singer um, but I wanted her to be in the middle of the group so that there were parts of the music where she sounds like she's being swallowed by all the different sounds. And then there were other parts where she rises from the orchestra on top of them. So it's very important for me that she was in the middle and not at the front. That then meant we could have a group of violins here and a group of violins here. So violin... One was here, violin two was here, and then we had violas kind of here, and cellos kind of here. Viola, cello, and then the thing I loved the most was having all the bass players in the middle. So they were right in the middle and they were behind Michaela. So every time she was singing very high, and the bass notes could come in really underneath her and with a lot of power from the back. I also um, hired double the amount of bass players you would normally have. So there was a lot of power here and, and beauty. And um, the engineer actually, Pavel, suggested splitting the violins into two groups because this is something that you'd find more in a soundtrack recording or, yes, this is sort of like a more standard modern technique to split violin ones and violin two wide across the front of the orchestra because you get this beautiful sound then. Then I had in my piece two harps. Often the harps, actually the harps always would sit together, probably here. Um, this time I had one harp here and one harp here. Harp left, harp right. And often they fitted with the um, echo concept that I had. So they would echo each other. Sometimes they were playing digga 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 
da, da, da. so they weren't always playing at the same time so it sounded like we'd put an echo onto the music when actually they were just sat separately and the composition um, had this echo concept within it. Then behind the bass, this is where it got really tricky because we had these lovely ladies playing flutes and we had the rest of the woodwinds, small instruments, sat behind massive instruments. And there's a lot of people here already. And then you've got two flute players, for example, sat behind a harp, behind all these people, trying to see the conductor, which is here. So this is a really big problem to get everyone happy. And there was lots of shuffling around and moving of microphones and chairs. And it was still difficult to have all these people sat behind uh, massive contrabass instruments. So that's some sort of weakness, I would say, with my piece, but I was determined to have the basses in the middle. And then we had the brass at the back, so something like horns, and the rest of the brass here, with a tuba over here, contrabassine, very beautiful, great low notes, flutes, rest of the woodwinds, horns, trumpets, trombones, bass trombone. So everything was split. And then right at the back, one of the most important featured sounds in letting go of the whole piece um, is the glockenspiel. Now, the glockenspiel comes in at the beginning of movement two when Michaela's losing her mind and letting go of this miracle that's previously happened to her. And um, the glock is supposed to represent when you are having some massive form of depression and the glock is like this new thought in the back of your mind like a, 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 a new idea or a piece of hope or something new growing from the distance in your mind and the glock plays this beautiful tiny melody coming right from the back of the orchestra and it's very ghostly and and this is you know if you think of this as being your mind then the glock is like this new thought coming from the back and the melody that the Glock plays is then copied or imitated by the pizzicato strings at the front. So it's almost like these new thoughts start to connect and grow more thoughts. So everything within the seating plan was that way connecting to the composition. And... Um, yeah, the seating plan, this is essentially the sound design. This is where the sound design happened. It happened in the space with the people and the instruments. It didn't happen in the computer. And there was nothing really to pan or move because everything was already set up in the space. We didn't need to pan the harps because they were already sat at different sides of the space. So, yeah, this was the majority of the sound design that I did was through the years of composition and thoughts that I had about the orchestra. So Czech Radio was recently refurbished um, and yeah, like I love that place because it has this old hall and it's been there for a long time, but they refurbished everything. So it's like a great place to now go and work. Um, we had an absolutely massive mixing desk, a Studer Vista 9, with 52 faders and 64 microphone inputs. We recorded using Apple Mac computer with Pro Tools 10, and we had uh, my favourite speakers in the whole world, made by Genelec 1038B and Genelec 771A. And... Uh, that it's like a huge, I mean, it's potentially a surround system if you want to use it in that way, but the speakers are like as big as people. Um, and then the, there were a lot of Neumann microphones and Schupp's microphones. Um, we had some different mic trees for the ambience above the orchestra, and then we had direct, a lot of direct microphones um, on the different instruments. Um, and yeah, it was a huge, it was a huge miking job. 
which was all done before we'd arrived, basically. <laughs> That's not true. We had, a, we had a lot still to do, but they seemed to handle it so smooth. That was the part of the production that was worrying me the most. Um, but that was the easiest bit. I mean, I guess the studio do that every day, like all the time. And um, it seemed very, a very easy thing to do, to have all these microphone channels um, for them. So yeah, that was interesting. So I have the bass players in the middle of the orchestra and normally they sit on the right side and then all the people behind them couldn't see the conductor so well. And we didn't have a lot of time for this and everybody had warned me before that you would need a click track and that's normal and that's how you do it. And I thought, no, it's going to be fine, we'll do it without. But it didn't work. So within about 20 minutes, we had to give everyone headphones and set up a click track. And that was very nerve wracking, but they did it very fast. And then also with things like editing, you know, if you have one half of a movement that you love and the end half of a different take, you know, and you want to put them together, how are you going to do that without any kind of click track, anything to cut to? It just, it, it wasn't possible. We didn't have the budget to have two days of rehearsing, you know. We went in cold with the music and the players are so professional and talented that they just arrived and played. And then we just worked, we worked through the piece. So if anything was drastically wrong, we would stop, discuss something, and then give the direction to the conductor and the orchestra to maybe start from eight bars before or the page before. Um, there's not too many edits in the piece. There's like two or three big ones. really difficult because everything on the day had been so incredible it was so loud and it was so real and everything was vibrating and all the people were there and then you know within one weekend four years of my work and my life were suddenly over and we were driving back to Berlin in the car and everything was on a hard drive and it just seemed so flat and lifeless and then I wasn't sure how to put it back together again to try and give people this experience that I'd had with the musicians on a CD. It was just like, oh no, this is, I'm only going to be able to give people 50% of what was really there. So yeah, I pretty much handed the hard drive and the responsibility over to my engineer and assistant producer, Peter Edwine. And he then spent weeks listening to everything. very like a, like a like a film you know and I didn't want to have a soundtrack sounding project I wanted it to sound real um, so I knew already that I wanted to keep it quite dry quite real I would rather have mistakes and unwanted sounds in the background than have this super clean polished thing so that was already the the, the direction that I'd given Peter 
Um, and then I just left him alone to listen and work. And in parallel, I also took some parts and played around with them. So I re actually the first section of the intro is all played backwards, which no one's really noticed until now. And I started experimenting more with creative effects, so putting um, delays on things, reversing things. And there's this really beautiful crescendo and huge build up towards this line where she's almost sort of screaming, I'm free and meaningless, meaningless. And it's so, yeah, loud and desperate. That's the, the notes we had for the conducting here. Um, so yeah, something that I've learned through the whole process is that to be a music producer, you really need to f put together a great team, find the right people, set up the right dynamic, make sure that they are also going to work well together and complement each other. Um, you need to have an idea of how to make budgets and how to be responsible with money, invoicing, tax, paying people on time. You also need to be very professional. In that moment where you maybe want to break down and be an emotional artist, you can't. You need to really be on point and be professional and never lose focus on your goal. And sometimes that means biting your tongue <laughs> and being diplomatic when it can you want to do the opposite, you know, you want to just shout at someone to do their job. But that's going to make a really terrible atmosphere amongst the group. So you have to constantly think the goal is the music, the goal is to have some harmony. You're the person that's, you know, the first one there, the last one to leave, the last one to eat, you know, and um, it's, it's very exhausting. but I'm very grateful that it happened.